Well, I would like to begin our time looking at the nature of the church by telling you a little bit about the accomplishments of the beloved Prince of, Pe of Preachers, Charles Spurgeon. In a week, Spurgeon would preach four to ten times, read six books, publish multiple sermons, lecture at the church, edit his monthly magazine, pastor a congregation of 6,000 congregants, and knew them all by name, oversaw a Bible school, ran an orphanage and 66 other Christian charities, and all the while serving his dying wife, Susie. This man was gifted beyond measure. I mean, most people would acknowledge that Spurgeon was essential to the ministry of Metropolitan Tabernacle, where he had pastored. But Spurgeon himself believed that there was a greater powerhouse to the ministerial success of that church. In fact, when friends would stroll by the church, Spurgeon would take them all on a tour. How cool would that be? They'd look at the architecture together. They'd look at all of the archways. They'd bring him, he'd bring them all over to the classrooms. He'd go to his office, show them the monstrosity that he had of a library. And then he'd take them to the basement. To the basement. And then he would uncover to these people the true powerhouse that drove the church. Faithful men and women. Devoted to praying for their pastor, the preaching of the word of God, and the advancement of the gospel throughout London. All kinds of people changed by God, man and woman, rich, poor, young, old, Scots, Brits, Welsh, all alike, tucked away in a basement, day after day, on their knees, faithfully praying, caring for the people in the church, and caring for lost souls in the world. Now, what does this have to do with the nature of of the church. Well, Spurgeon recognized the unity of the body through the diversity of its members, unified by the gospel to be on mission. And as we're going to see today, God has uniquely arranged his diverse blood bought saints into one body in Christ. And the beauty of the church shines forth through diversity and unity as the gospel motivates us to care for one another in the church, in the body, and to care for lost souls in the world. So as we reflect on those things this morning, please open your Bibles with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And that's on page 959 in the Bibles below the chair in front of you. And while you turn there, feel free to grab your outline. And so you're going to notice that there are three points this morning that we have the opportunity to look at. Number one, the church is diverse. Two, the church is unified. And three, the church is on mission. So please follow along this morning as I read 1 Corinthians chapter 12. We'll start in verse 4 and read through verse 11. So Paul writes, Now there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are varieties of service, but the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who empowers them all in everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. For to one is given through the Spirit the utterance of wisdom, and to another the utterance of knowledge according to the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, gifts of healing by the one Spirit. To another, the working of miracles. To another, prophecy. To another, the ability to distinguish between spirits. To another, various kinds of tongues. To another, the interpretation of tongues. All these are empowered by one and the same Spirit, who apportions to each one individually as he wills. Now, as we begin this morning, it's important just to understand exactly where we are in 1 Corinthians. So Paul's just entered into a dialogue on spiritual gifts within the church. And to this point, he's been highlighting, and he continues to highlight the very idea that we're going to be discussing this morning. The church is diverse, and the church is unified. 
So just look at some of the references that Paul makes to the diversity of the body of Christ. Right? He speaks of the diversity of gifts of the Spirit throughout the first ten verses of this chapter. Just listen to verse 8. For to one is given through the Spirit the utterance of wisdom, and to another the utterance of knowledge. Verse 9. To another faith, to another gifts of healing. So the point is, those who are Christians in the church are given a variety of gifts by the Spirit. Therefore, each member contributes to the diversity of the whole. Different people united under the whole. Now look what it says in verse 11. All these are empowered by one and the same Spirit who apportions to each one individually as he wills. So notice what Paul's getting at here. The church is diverse. They're not all given the same exact gift. But the church is unified because they're all empowered and apportioned by who? By the one and the same Spirit. Now what does that look like when you're dealing with real people in a real church? Well, it's helpful to not only look at diversity as a theory, right? But diversity as a reality. So to give us a clearer picture of diversity, let's turn to Acts chapter 16. And so as you turn with me to Acts chapter 16 this morning, it's helpful for us to just be reminded of what the context is of the passage in Acts is, right? During Paul's second missionary journey, he receives a vision from the Lord and immediately turns his sights to Macedonia to preach the gospel. And so he goes, he engages those in and around the region of Philippi, and we're going to encounter three very interesting people. A businesswoman, a slave girl, and a Philippian jailer. And I want us to notice three things as we're looking at these people. So one, the gospel's proclaimed. Two, the people respond. And three, they are radically changed. So let's read together in Acts chapter 16, verses 11 through 15. So setting sail from Choaz, we made a direct voyage to Samothrace, and the following day to Neapolis, and from there to Philippi, which is a leading city of the district of Macedonia and a Roman colony. We remained in this city some days, and on the Sabbath day, we went outside the gate to the riverside, where we supposed there was a place of prayer, and we sat down and spoke to the women who had come together. One who heard us was a woman named Lydia, from the city of Thyatira, a seller of purple goods, who was a worshiper of God. The Lord opened her heart to pay attention to what was said by Paul, and after she was baptized, and her household as well, she urged us, saying, if you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come to my house and stay. And she prevailed upon us. So example number one, the businesswoman. Right? Verse 14 says, One who heard us was a woman named Lydia from the city of Thyatira, a seller of purple goods who was a worshiper of God. So in just this one verse, we have a ton of information about this lady Lydia. Right? For one, she's a woman selling purple goods. I mean, during this time, you needed some serious cash in order to get your hands on purple dye. That's hard to come by. It's very hard to come by, and it's a really pretty penny if you get it. So she's a successful businesswoman and probably has a little bit of prestige to her name. And what does Luke tell us? Look again at verse 14. She's a worshiper of God. So in some way, shape, or form, she's a religious woman. A religious woman without her heart opened. Why do I say that? Well, just look at verse 14 again. Paul preaches the gospel to Lydia, and it says, The Lord opened her heart to pay attention to what, Paul, what was said by Paul. So she hears the gospel preached, and the Lord opens her heart miraculously, and she responds in faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Then she's baptized. So just notice the pattern with me, with this woman. The gospel's preached, she responds in faith. So first example, a businesswoman. Second example, a slave girl. Now let's read Acts 16, 16 through 24, picking up where we left off. As we were going to the place of prayer, 
we were met by a slave girl who had a spirit of divination and brought her owners much gain by fortune telling. She followed Paul and us, crying out, These men are servants of the Most High God, who proclaim to you the way of salvation. And this she kept doing for many days. Paul, having become greatly annoyed, turned and said to the spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And it came out that very hour. But when her owners saw that their hope of gain was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace before the rulers. And when they had brought them to the magistrates, they said, These men are Jews, and they're dis disturbing our city. They advocate customs that are not lawful for us as Romans to accept or practice. The crowd joined in attacking them, and the magistrates tore the garments off them and gave orders to beat them with rods. And when they had afflicted many blows upon them, they threw them into prison, ordering the jailer to keep them safely. Having received this order, he put them into the inner prison and fastened their feet in the stocks. So verse 16 tells us she has a spirit of divination. She brings her owners much gain by fortune telling. So it seems as though this little girl had a demonic spirit who would give info in order to tell people their future. So she's a demon-possessed slave girl. That's a very interesting lady, right? She's used by these cruel men to make money for her captors. And what happens in verse 17? Well, she follows Paul, who's proclaiming the gospel and places the largest target ever imaginable on this dude's back. And this is when the story gets really good. Verse 18, Paul having become greatly annoyed. This lady's been following, this girl's been following him around. He gets annoyed and he goes, okay, we're done with this. Come out of that little girl. Demon comes out and that very hour, the spirit's gone. And here's the result. Verse 19, but when her owners saw that their hope of gain was gone, they seized Paul and Silas. Why did her owners see that they had no hope of, hope of gain? Because the demonic spirit who was the source of her fortune telling was gone. But also I tend to lean in the direction that not only was she released from the destruction of the demonic spirit, but she was also released from the penalty and power of sin. This little girl comes to faith in the Lord Jesus. Not only is she healed physically, but spiritually. And once again, just hear the pattern. The gospel is preached. The slave girl is healed physically and spiritually, responds in faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, and her life is radically changed. No more captors. And changed by the gospel. So example number one, a businesswoman. Example number two, a slave girl. And now example number three, a Philippian jailer. So let's read this final account here, verses 25 through 34. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. And the prisoners were listening to them. And suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken. And immediately all the doors were open and everyone's bonds were unfastened. When the jailer woke and saw that the prison doors were open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself, supposing that the prisoners had escaped. But Paul cried with a loud voice, Do not harm yourself, for we are all here. And the jailer called for lights and rushed in, and trembling with fear, he fell down before Paul and Silas. Then he brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved, you and your household. And they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house. And he took them the same hour of the night and washed their wounds, and he was baptized at once, he and all his family. Then he brought them up into his house and set food before them. And he rejoiced along with the entire household that he had believed in God. So in the midst of an uproar in the city because of a demon being ripped from the body of a little girl, Paul and Silas are thrown into this jail. And so while they're sitting in this jail cell, they are singing praises to the Lord, and boom, an earthquake. And the doors are opened, and the chains are unfastened, 
And at this point, the jailer wakes up, and what does he see? Open doors. Look at verse 27. What does he tell us? This jailer, a big, strong guard, who is an officer in the Roman colony, has failed to keep his orders, and he's about to kill himself. And then Paul says in verse 28, Do not harm yourself, for we are all here. And at this moment, the jailer falls to the ground, completely terrified, overwhelmed. And what does he say to Paul? Verse 30, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Paul preaches the gospel to this weepy, fearful Roman jailer. And what's the jailer's response? He puts his faith in Christ, and he's baptized. So just see the, the pattern again with me. The gospel's proclaimed. The jailer responds in faith, and his life is radically changed. Now what's my point in looking at all these people, right? Well, first we see the threefold pattern. The gospel's preached, they respond rightly in faith. They're all radically changed. But this is a very diverse group of people. I mean, you have a wealthy religious woman, a demon-possessed, fortune-telling little girl, and a strong, resilient Philippian jailer. But all three come to faith. Which means these three unique and diverse people are now one in Christ. They're one which means that they are unified, not by social status, not by looks, not by hobbies, but through the blood of the lamb that was slain, which tells us that they would all most likely have been members in the same church, in Philippi. These three people, diverse portions of the body of Christ in the same church in the first century. How fascinating is that to think about? I mean, completely different people, now unified as one body. And just like these three people, the church is supposed to be radically diverse. I mean, just think of the diversity in our church. This goes deeper than merely introverts and extroverts. This is to be equated with the depths of diversity of Jews and Greeks, slaves and freemen, as we're going to see in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. So we have different socioeconomic statuses, ethnicities, political leanings, occupations, family dynamics, and yet we have all been purposed by God for the good of the church. And so we're not talking universal church, even though that's glorious. We're talking about this local assembly. Now we must ask ourselves this morning, do we accept and appreciate those who are completely different from us in this church? Or are we prone to be quick to judge those who are different from us? You know, one of the greatest displays of our value of one another is in the time that we take to talk to those who are completely different from us in this building. So how are you doing? So I've been reflecting this. How am I doing? Right? If I'm going to preach this, how am I doing in loving those who are completely different from me? So are you stuck talking to the same group of people week after week? Or are you getting out of your comfort zone and edifying those who are completely different from you in this body? Now, we've seen that the church is certainly diverse. It has been and it continues to be. But let's go and flip back to 1 Corinthians 12. And I want us to see that the church is unified from the perspective of the local church. So we must first see that Paul's, declara Paul's declaration of unity there. So turn back with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And we will keep reading where we left off earlier. So we'll start in verse 12 and we'll read through verse 27. And see this declaration that Paul has for us here. For just as the body is one, and as many members... And all the members of the body, though many are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and all were made to drink of one spirit. For the body does not consist of one member, but of many. If the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. 
And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would be the sense of hearing? If the whole body were an ear, where would be the sense of smell? But as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them as he chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, yet one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And on those parts of the body that we think less honorable, we bestow the greater honor. And our unpresentable parts are treated with greater modesty, which our more presentable parts do not require. But God has so composed the body, giving greater honor to the part that lacked it, that there may be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. Now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. So as we jump in, look at verse 12 with me. Right? For just as the body is one and as many members and all the members of the body, though many are one body, and so it is with Christ. For in one spirit, we were all baptized into one body. Jews and Greeks, slaves are free, and all were made to drink of one spirit. So just notice how many times Paul mentions one here. Four times in two verses. The repetition here strengthens his point, right? The members in Christ are one. They're unified, baptized, made to drink of one spirit. Jews and Greeks, slaves and free, all Diverse people, reborn by the Spirit of God. I mean, just think of the beauty of a baseball team. So, the beautiful Yankees. Just think of that baseball team. Nine players all at one time on one field. You have the pitcher, who his job is to throw as fast as he can to the batter, right? But the pitcher can't be the center fielder. He can't be... The thrower, the really hard throwing, fast, just throwing, well, well grounded fielder at short or third or second. No, he's just the pitcher. But they're all necessary for the outcome to win the game. One team together. But if that doesn't scratch an itch for you, here's another one. What about a construction site? You have everyone with different tasks, different abilities, different techniques different tools, and yet one job, one site, one motivation, the completion of the project. It may take a little longer, but completed nonetheless. So one crew together, and so it is with the body of Christ. Many members, one body. So we've seen the, declar the declaration of unity in verses 12 through 13. But Paul goes on to unpack some examples of disunity that arise among the body, which include, one, the diminishing of members, and two, the dispensable members. So first, let's look at the diminishing members together. So in verse 15 through 16, Paul writes using some personification here, meaning he attributes emotions to a feature that in all actuality has no emotion, right? A big toe can't cry. That'd be really weird. So he's trying to prove his point, and he does a great job of doing it. He's connecting members of the body of Christ, you and me, with appendages of the human body. Now it says, right, in 15 through 16, if the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. So just look at the foolish logic that is used by these so-called foot and ears, right? Logic by body parts. They're making an incorrect observation that states that the foot and eye, they look down on their specific part of the body. They don't see any adequacy. There's no worth with this specific portion that they've been given. But why? Well, because they don't have the same job as the hand or the eye. 
the hand and the eye, they got it better than them. And so doing, they write themselves off from even being a part of the body. They say they're worthless, not worth being a part of that one person. David Garland, a New Testament scholar, comments on these verses stating, the failure of one little valve can shut down the whole bodily system. The implication is that there is no unimportant gift or unimportant person in the body of Christ. Do you hear that? Every member is absolutely essential to the rest of the body. There are no unimportant gifts. Each member is necessary and not a nuisance. But what about you? I mean, I have certainly had points in my life where I have asked the same questions that Paul draws out for us here. Do you think that your role right now at Christ Proclamation Church as a member of this local body is not of any significance? Do you think that you're not worth being a part of this body? Well, be encouraged, because it is. You are so important to this church. And so I'm not doing this just to puff you up. This is what the Bible says. And that's exactly what Paul's telling the church in Corinth. So the thought that some members of the body can be diminished or even eliminated is a contradiction to the entirety of Scripture. And why is that? Well, look at verse 17 with me. If the whole body were an eye, where would be the sense of hearing? If the whole body were an ear, where would be the sense of smell? So according to verse 17, why is each member so significant? It's because each member has a unique function. You're gifted in certain ways that other people are not gifted. I mean, just think of our church building. There are things that get done in this building before a Sunday morning that are never even realized. And it's just faithful men and women utilizing the unique ways in which God has gifted them for the good of the church. Like John Lemon. I love this brother. The man's here early and often in the cold, right? Shoveling snow an hour before anyone else arrives. Or mowing the lawns for hours upon hours in the summertime with a smile on his face. Faithfully serving the body utilizing his unique abilities that God gave him to serve the rest of us. And it's a blessing which frees other members in this church to play music, to greet, to teach kinder kids, to preach the word of God. So these are not trivial matters with no purpose. No, these are good, glorious opportunities from the Lord. These are good works for the sake of the kingdom. It's kingdom work. Because each and every work enables the proclamation of the gospel. So I'm thankful for that, brother. But with all that said, Paul doesn't stop with his argument at the unique function of each member. But just listen to verse 18. But as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them as he chose. Now, don't miss this point this morning. God arranges the joining of people and their gifting within the church. The sovereign king of the universe, who put stars into motion, who with a word brought forth light, who gave you breath, who sustains your very breath this moment, he arranged it. God chose the members in this body with the specific and diverse purpose to be one in Christ. This is the intention. That right now, right here, diverse people would be joined together. Just look around. These people God arranged to be with you, to edify, stir up one another for the good of our body, and for the glory of his name. How encouraging is that this morning? So Paul uncovers the foolishness of diminishing the members of the church and delves into another example that can spark disunity within the church. 
right? The unhelpful assumption that there are dispensable members. So in this second section, Paul begins to highlight another example of disunity using, once again, personification with the body parts. So in verse 20, 21, he says, The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. Nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. But why not? Why can't they say that? Well, according to Paul, it's impossible. The eye cannot say to the hand, the head cannot say to the feet, that I don't need you. They can't do it. But why? Well, it's just obvious. You need the rest of the body. It would be as if you were to go and chop off your leg, right? Because you think that you're just, well, you're disillusioned in thinking that you can actually go on without that foot. But what happens as soon as you try and walk away without that foot, you're dropping to the floor. You need that foot. And so it is here. You need every member. We need every member. We're essential, which displays the beauty of diversity and unity. The hand is not the foot, clearly. The foot is not the head. Every member is essential, which is exactly what Paul emphasizes in verses 22 through 24. The members are necessary and equally and entirely valuable. Just notice how verse 22 begins, right? So Paul contrasts verse 22 with verse 21, which spoke of the foolish thinking of the eye and the head that are unable to say, I have no need of you, right? So it starts by saying, on the contrary, So in contrast to verse 21, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. Now what does Paul mean by indispensable here? Well, he means they are entirely necessary. So the seemingly insignificant are not in the slightest bit indispensable. But they're just as important as the rest of the members. The foot and the head are so important. Both equally necessary. Just look at verses 23 through 24. And on those parts of the body that we think less honorable, we bestow the greater honor. And our unpresentable parts are treated with greater modesty, which our more presentable parts do not require. But God has so composed the body, giving greater honor to the part that lacked it. Now do you see what this tells us? We must not lose sight of the last part of verse 24. But God has so composed the body, giving greater honor to the part that lacked it. So what's of importance to God? The one who lacked honor. Those that are seen as dispensable. God himself gives honor to the seemingly dispensable. Now just think about this, right? If God himself gives honor to those that the world deems dispensable, how should we look on those in the body of Christ that God displays worth, that God declares indispensable? We should look on those members, those brothers and sisters with honor because every member is indispensable. And it's not just a fact of just equality here or there. It's because God has declared that they are indispensable. We're one, many members in the same body. And no one discounts, no one discredits, no one deems anyone unworthy. It's not a category. I mean, let's think of the many roles in our church. You have the pastor, to the Sunday morning greeter, to the staff, to all the elders, But what about those in our church who are serving faithfully behind the scenes? Workdays, hospitality, pew runners, Costco shoppers, snow shovelers, all vital to our church family because there are no second-class citizens. There's no hierarchy from greatest to the least. No, we are equal men and women united in Christ by the work of Christ. You know, I can't help but think to Charles Spurgeon and the true powerhouses of the ministry 
at the Metropolitan Tabernacle? Who did he consider to be the indispensable ones? According to Spurgeon, it was the faithful men and women, diverse people, stuffed into a stinking basement, praying for their pastor, praying for the gospel going forth, praying for those in their community, all the while doing so quietly in the basement of a megachurch. They're the heavy lifters, those that seemingly are, are dispensable. Now we have our fair share of people just like that in this congregation that I'm just so thankful for. Right? I mean, if you sit for 10 minutes with people like Ken and Gail Passon, you understand this reality all the more. I mean, two dear Christians willing to do whatever is most helpful for the church. And one of the greatest ways they serve us is praying without ceasing. Praying without ceasing for our pastor and for our elders, for our church family. I mean, what a showcase of the beauty of diversity and unity amongst the body. Essential, indispensable members of the household of God. It's so fascinating and so cool to see this actually in action in our church. So the church is diverse and unified. But why is there such a need to see the blessing of diversity and unity in the body? Well, look at verse 25. That there may be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. Now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. So division mounts when there's no appreciation of our diversity in persons and in gifting. Division snuffs out love. It plagues, it suffocates it, and makes us absolutely dull to joy. It destroys it. But notice what the opposite of division is here. What does Paul say in 25 through 27? The opposite of division is care. Is care for one another. So being on mission in this church looks like caring for one another in the body that is motivated radically by the gospel, specifically in one, in suffering, and two, in rejoicing. So to begin, we care for one another in the body in and through suffering. In fact, we're called to suffer with one another, right? Just thinking of different passages that stress this idea. Galatians chapter 6, verse 2 says, Bear one another's burdens. Romans 12, 15, Weep with those who weep. Now these aren't just random commands to try out with some friends outside of the church on a Friday night. No. This is a command for the care of others within the body of Christ. Right here to be enacted together. As members of the same body, we're to care for one another in suffering. Now, what do you think of that? <laughs> I don't like the sound of that very much, to be honest. But this is what the Bible says, right? No one likes to suffer, but it's clearly taught here. So it's clearly teaching this reality. Don't just suffer well when you encounter Various trials and difficulties, my brothers, right? Not just James. No, when your brother or sister is suffering, you're to suffer with them. This is so hard. It's, it's hard to even comprehend. But what are some of the practical ways that we can be faithful in love and care to our fellow members? What does it actually look like to care for those that are suffering? Right, right now, if we like it or not, there are people in our congregation that are struggling. So what does it look like to love them well? Well, I think that on the surface, we can check in with daily text messages, right? emails, 
phone calls, even sending cards, or just being present. Obviously, it's difficult with COVID right now, but sometimes when life is hard and suffering is real, it's just helpful to be there, in the room. I mean, some of us have experienced this. Hand on the shoulder, weeping with your brother or sister that's broken. But another way, which may seem obvious, but it is oh so essential, is that we pray. That we would be a people that pray for one another. Going before the Father early and often in prayer for your brother or sister who's hurting. And just think of how much of an impact that has even on you and even your love for your church when this takes place. Right? I'm sure that there are several of us in this very room who've experienced insurmountable suffering, maybe in this past year. And so what makes, what makes hard times sweet? What makes hard times sweet? The joy of the Lord in hardship through the care of a radically diverse yet unified church coming to the aid of the broken and the downtrodden. But you know, I won't care well for those that I don't see of actually any value. If I don't actually love and care for your well-being, I'm not going to pray for you. So then we must address something else first. We must address and go before the Lord to pray for our own hearts, for the people of God, to love each other in greater degrees, that we would love the church like Christ loved the church. Dr. Tom Schreiner once said, the body functions well and the gifts are being exercised rightly when the church is a place of love. So being on mission within this church should be laced in a profound love for one another as we look to care well for one another in times of suffering. Secondly, we care for one another in the body by rejoicing together. We like this one a lot more. We like to rejoice a lot more than we like to suffer. No duh. <laughs> so Paul does a wonderful job of capturing the highs and the lows here, right, in regard to caring for one another in the church. So we have the lows of suffering and the highs of rejoicing when one is honored, right? We love it when someone's honored, the opportunity to rejoice together. But I think that actually this can be quite difficult, at least for me, because we live in a culture right now that's absolutely marred by competition and superiority. Right? I'm sure we have all felt this. We want to be the best. We want to be praised. We're to hate when the person next to us excels. When the guy on the, you know, two cubicles over gets the promotion that I wanted, I'm supposed to be absolutely ripped. That was my job. That's straight from our culture. And it has horrible ramifications for us in the church. But that's where Paul helps us reshape the way we live within our culture. Right? We're not jumping out of this place yet. Pray, Lord. Right? But we're not to disdain the one who's honored. But we're to rejoice with them. Now let me ask you, are you quick to take pleasure in the blessings of others? Are you quick to be thrilled with the new job, the promotion, the victory over sin, the engagement, the pregnancy, or the A on the test? Or are you in the corner of the room, looking down in disgust, broken because it isn't you? the roll of the eyes, the disdain for the blessing in light of your recent injustice. How can this be? I'm suffering, and why has God blessed them? Is that your orientation? Is that my orientation? I think that there's an opportunity for us to put away every bit of envy, lust, anger, pride, when we begin to rejoice in the pleasures and the good things that God is doing in the life of those that he has been gracious to. The beauty of seeing the good works of God and rejoicing together. So I'd encourage you to practice this opportunity of rejoicing as a life group. 
rejoice exceedingly with those dear brothers and sisters. You're, you're sharing prayer requests throughout the year, right? So you're always asking for things that you'd like to grow in, ways that you'd like to grow in grace, those that you would love to see coming to saving faith, those illnesses you would love to see subside, the start of a new job, the blessing of a baby, whatever it may be. Make a running account of these things. Keep a note and pray faithfully and watch as God works. Just watch. And when he's kind in these different areas, rejoice exceedingly. Rejoice exceedingly in thanksgiving and praise to God with those who have shared those particular requests. And relish in this beautiful opportunity that God purposed eternally for us, enjoying living in community together. And lastly, just as we've seen in Acts 16, earlier in the ministry of Paul and Silas, right? It may seem like an eternity ago. So work to care for lost souls in the world. We're to be on mission to see that the lost are found. There's no greater display of care for those in the world than by sharing the good news of the gospel of Christ. You want to love those in the world? Preach the gospel. And there may be some of you right now, you may not even know at this current moment that you're lost. And this is actually my opportunity to care for you. Some of you may be living for the here and now. Right? How can I make my life better today? What three easy steps can I take in order to make sure that I stay right with God, but without any cost to my wallet or my dreams? But those of you who have not yet believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, I'm here to tell you this morning that you're lost and that you're in need of rescue. You've traveled a path that's well walked in disobedience toward our Creator. And each day in luxury without Jesus is another moment wasted with future and further judgment mounting upon you. So I beg you this morning to turn to Jesus, the one who's truly able to save, the one who shed his blood for men and women to find rest for all of eternity. Don't spend another second wandering for morsels when God has sent his son to be your everlasting satisfaction. Don't waste a moment. Believe in the Lord Jesus and you'll be saved. Now those who are members of the same body, right here, right now, there is work to be done. As faithful soldiers, there's work. So just think back with me to Acts chapter 16. And just think about Paul and Silas for a moment. How were they able to reach diverse people like the businesswoman, the slave girl, and the Philippian jailer? Unabashed boldness. Clarity on the gospel. And care for the souls of men. And these three ideas should invigorate us this morning. I mean, they were men on mission. They had one goal and would do whatever it took in order to care well for those that were lost. They would sing as loud as they possibly could. They engaged in awkward conversations. And they were unfazed by the sight of persecution. Singing while in shackled. They were faithful to the task before them. As should we. So let us be bold. Let us be clear on the gospel and actually care for lost souls. People who right now are on a fast track to hell. So let us care well for those in the world who day by day are marching toward future days of judgment. Brothers and sisters, in light of this glorious opportunity, that we have been given to be on mission. May God give us the grace to shine. That we shine forth the diversity and unity of the body. 
and that we would be propelled by the precious work of our Savior to be a people that care well for one another in this church. But not just that, but that we would be propelled to care for lost souls in the world. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that in time, in before time even began, you set into motion the plan to establish and develop and bring about a unified and diverse church. And Lord, we're thankful that we are members of one body in Christ. And we pray that we would live on mission, that we would care for those in this church, that we would love one another well, and that we would love one another enough to go together in the battle to care for lost souls in the world. God, would you give us grace as we look to just love the body and glorify you in all that we do. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.